Well, Kate, how are you doing? I am really well. Thank you, Ben. I I am a huge fan of the TV show Coupling, which I actually have the first season right here. And let me tell you, it has been, I bought this at the beginning of summer and I went to every bookstore and every website trying to find it. And I finally found one. Well done. Well done. You could be a detective. Yes. And from making the show, what was your favorite memory? Oh, oh, my God. oh dear. There were so many. There were so many. Oh, one of them was channeling Sally uh, a bit in real life. And I found this with a couple of the characters I played is the quite severe side of Sally is really good to harness when you're trying to get a, a ticket on the tube or um, a seat on the bus, you know, or, you know, just things like that, get people to move when you need to get through a line. Um, she just, just playing her gave me a little bit more um, sense of self and not authority, but certainly a sense of entitlement, which is really good. Um, as long as you don't become a monster. Mm -hmm. um, but but really overall the whole show was, was such a joy. We were, our producer was Beryl Virtue and then her daughter Sue Virtue was also producer. Um, and Sue's husband, Stephen Moffat was writer. So whilst that was quite a, uh, gave quite a strict parameter to work within, um, you know, you couldn't say to the writer, oh my God, the producers are really horrible. You know, equally you couldn't say, the writing for my part is shit. And happily it wasn't, so I could never need to say that. Um, it was actually wonderful. It was true family. It was real, real family. And um, I wouldn't say we were all like family, by the end of it we certainly weren't we were like maybe more typical families you know there was a few fallings out and what have you but it was a really joyous thing to be part of and um oh I just yeah Sue Virtue and Beryl were tremendous and then Stephen Moffat because I'm a very awkward person and then Stephen would be even more awkward than me so when you have to do the love, the lovely part of being in a successful show is you have to do the 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 the, the parties and the um, turn up from you know various things, uh, junkets, and he would be squirming more than I would. Um, so there was a sort of a, a camaraderie in that a comradeship. <laughs> Sorry, I want to give you a really exciting anecdote. There were just too many to think of any one great example um but there were such lovely people involved um and we really we really did have a laugh you know it's it's funny because i never realized this at the beginning because i i started watching the show when covid happened and the lockdown happened there was nothing else to do and i was just binging through through amazon amazon prime and i saw the show and i went ahead and watched it and i discovered it on the beginning of a Vicar of Dibley DVD. It was like the first season. Yeah. And my my nan is from the UK. So that's how I got, I get hooked on all these shows. And I discovered this trailer. It's like, oh yeah, this looks hilarious. So I went ahead and watched it. And something I didn't realize, but your co-star, Jack Devonport, played James Norrington in Pirates of the Caribbean. So, and how did it feel getting to work work with him? Did you know that he was going to become James no, Norrington? Jack, Jack had... Um... There was this fantastic series called This Life on uh, British TV that predated Coupling. And Jack had been one of uh, the principals in that and a real standout star in that. So he already had that luster of, you know, he's already a success. His parents were both really fantastic actors too. So he came with that that cargo, but, um, but it, we pretty much knocked him into shape. Um, and the fantastic thing about Jack is um, he, 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 I think he's probably his own worst critic. And um, also, but also he's a, he's a professional. So he gets it. You, you know, you, you're there to do the job. And um, so it was lovely working, you know, he was really sweet and fun to work with and actually, really quite nervous a lot of the time so 
that always appeals to me. Um, and he did Pirates of the Caribbean after we'd done, or the Caribbean, after we'd done maybe one or two series, I can't remember, maybe the first series. So, so then he came back from this um, interesting, Pirates of the Caribbean was my favorite, all time favorite ride in um, Disneyland. So I was just like, I should be in it. But he came back from it and it, that was fun. But it never, it never, um, unbalanced him or or the cast so it was just jack's back you know and it was it was a big deal for him he knew it he knew it was a big franchise um uh yeah it was he was sweet sweet work. Very cool. well we have one of the cast members from pirates of the caribbean coming on the show later later on this season that's uh, the one that it's kevin mcnally who played josh mcgibbs from- oh now there's an actor he's a Kevin McNally is a proper oh, yes. actor. And the awful thing about doing a cup, series like Coupling and TV like that is, you know, the rest of the Brits just think, yeah, you're just a cheap TV series actor. You're shallow. Um, and Kevin McNally has, you know, really earned his chops. No, he's great. Oh, yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't know me, but say hello for me. You got it. Well, we'll do. Yeah, we're actually trying to work on a project together uh, once the... You know, so in the United States, we've been going through a crisis. I'm I'm not a member of the guild. I'm trying to become a member, but I'm not a member of the guild yet. But it's the Screen Actors Guild, and both the Screen Actors Guild and the writers they're they're going through a strike at the moment, and it, it hasn't been well. So once the you know strike ends and they could figure out some sort of agreement, yeah, we'll be back on track. But anyhow, are you currently working on any projects at the moment? Um. I not not right. I fin just finished uh, a, a when I say low budget, it had no budget whatsoever. But it was one of the um, most um, uh, reward mm, rewarding things I've ever done. Actually, it was a little short film, um, and it's set over in Cannes in France, um, and it is it literally deals with the whole. Um, subject of the Cannes Film Festival representing the facade of glamour that we attach to really any of the performance arts, but particularly now to the um, acting. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, all arts are getting there, are, are glamorized, but acting particularly because of the success of the Oscars and the Cannes Film Festival and now the other international festivals. So we were, it was just a group of friends, someone I knew, a very dear friend of mine, Birgitta Bernhard, had written it. And uh, we all just turned up for her. What inspired you to become an actress? What was the moment that, that you realized, oh, this is what I want to do? Uh, weirdly, I was incredibly, sorry, this is such a cliche, incredibly shy. I mean, I found talking to people quite difficult. And then we had a, a school play when I was about seven. And I just felt really at home there. I think also my I my parents were really strict. Um, my children think I am. I am nothing like them. Uh, oh God, I've said it. I've become the next generation. No, my parents were really strict. And you did, did not emote. Um, and I, I, I bursting it's like I didn't want to run and scream or cry or whatever um so I remember being on stage and thinking I I feel really I'm really I know what to do here I'm really at home here um and that sort of that obviously you don't think oh I'm gonna make a career now um but that stayed with me and I I love ballet as well and judo funnily enough but in the end um I wasn't going to be brilliant at ballet. And so I started to turn towards drama. And that had always been there underlying everything. It was the, 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 the love of acting and of words. Um, and I think if it hadn't been drama, I would have gone into journalism. But definitely drama was really the thing. And I was really yeah really committed to it weirdly um um i don't know I, I yeah so it was a school play 
and then just loving um, the, some of the plays that we were reading. Um, again, it would have been at school and just gradually knowing that that's what I was going to do. Um, yeah, and it just sort of funneled in through there. Very cool, very cool. And we have two questions left of the interview. And what advice would you give to folks who want to become actors or journalists or trying to get into the field? What is the best advice that you would pass on to those future stars? Okay. Um, for actors, I would say just don't do it. Just don't do it. Find something else to do. Uh, the business is utterly different from the impulse to create and um, and to refine your craft and to really develop. The industry is not about that. Um, so going into it for a profession is a very uh, unhealthy thing to do. I would recommend not doing it. However, anyone who loves acting, listening to me, like I was a long time ago, will just go, la, 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 I'm not listening to that. It doesn't, won't apply to me. And it, so what I'm saying is be aware, the industry, in the minute you become professional, I think in any field, it becomes a different beast. So look for the people that are um, most dynamic or, or, or work for you the best. Um, you don't have a lot of say as an actor, you know, you will take the works, particularly in Britain, you take the work where, you, where it comes, because mm -hmm. uh, it's always it's very poorly paid usually. Um, you take the work and you'll find people. Um, be decent, but you know, stand up for yourself. Just don't be a shit. Uh, and ah, uh, so uh, so many things to say. Um, but just remember, you may think you're entering any given field, but let's take acting as that's my thing. Um, and you have this sort of nebulous goal that you will make it and you will be all right and you'll be elevated into a better living standard. Just remember, you will never get there. Your, your destination will always be a bit out of reach. So just remember, this is it. Every step of your way, this is it. There is no it to get to. Oh, I'll make it. No, no, no. It is really is now. Um, and it's very valuable when things are rough just to go, but I'm still here. And, you know, if you're well, you're here and you're living to fight another day, uh, it will change. But I'm afraid this is it. And it may get better. But even then, you'll never arrive. You'll never arrive. The destination is always ahead. Um, so, so don't be, don't kid yourself. Really work out what's worth, what are the things in life that are worth living for you or will have made your life worth living and you may achieve none of it. But think of that before you embark or particularly if you get caught in a slipstream of success, really think, what was it that I thought I needed to make my life worthwhile? Um, because more success breeds more angst. Uh, and I think it's quite an unhealthy place to live. It, it is very much. Yeah, we just uh, we just rewatched the Elvis movie that came out last year with Austin Butler and Tom Hanks. And just thinking about that movie with, you know, all the, you know, the harsh things that Carl Tom Parker puts Elvis through, I mean, Yes, I mean you're definitely you're definitely right. And mm. also speaking of Elvis, we have a a Elvis right here. If that's a thing of beauty, a, an Elvis gnome. That's who made that. I did. Oh my god! Oh Ben, you are you see multi talented. Not a guy, a polymath. Yeah, oh. my parents and I we made Elvis gnomes last last week. We went and saw an Elvis impersonator and. It was kind of an Elvis, an Elvis themed week. You know that's going to sell for thousands. Yes, it's great. Baz Luhrmann will buy that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And oh, uh, 
very last question of the interview, since this is a retro show, what was your favorite retro product growing up as a child or a teen or an early adult? And it could be anything from an action figure, a product, movie, TV show, video game, or even board game. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. Well, really quickly, um, fun, as you said, a product, I suddenly went Barbie because I lived in Hong Kong for a while. My father bought me a Barbie as my sort of, it's going to be great, Kate. Here's a present. And I loved my Barbie. And since, you know, we just had the Barbie movie, that seems pertinent again. Did you go watch it? I went to watch it. Yeah, yeah, I watched it. Um, so it's strange to come back to that because that was like a seminal moment, getting this doll. Because as I say, my parents were quite Puritan. Um, so Barbie, but I love my slinky going down the stairs. I love Pac-Man. You know, we had the little Nintendos and I, oh, my whole, this is the trouble. My whole life could have just been spent on that tiny gadget, um, let alone now we have the access to the whole wide world on our, at the tip of our fingertips or thumbs. Um, so Pac-Man, Slinky, Barbie and board games. There was a game called Sorry and that might've been Chinese. From Hong Kong but it was uh it was another great game you know and the whole idea of sorry is that you're really not as you knock everybody out um yeah this was those were some of the standout oh and twister a fun game. and it's hilarious too because because I mean even when you're trying to you know put your hands or put your feet on the on the dots it's like oh Jeez, you, it's you, you're trying hard not to fall, and that's that's the whole point. You're trying. Hard that's to the It's a really good <laughs> icebreaker. If you need to warm everyone up at a party, get the twister sheet out. <laughs> and you know the people who will play it are going to be good fun. The other ones who are really protecting themselves, yeah, they're not going to be such fun. Oh, uh, twister, I love that name. The fun game. I haven't played it in. I don't even remember the last time. It might have been ten the last time I played it. Oh yeah, I mean I haven't played it. We did get another Twister game out some time ago. And, oh, my God, I just couldn't understand how I ever was so limber. So, yeah, good game to keep soft, um, supple. Yes. Well, Kate, thank you very much for joining today's episode. It's been a blast getting and to meet you. I wish I could have said something, just a real nugget of deep truth or fascinating insight. But it was really... It was, Really lovely to talk to you. Thank you for taking the trouble. Thank you. I, I've been looking forward to this ever since the summer because I, I am a huge fan of the show Coupling. I mean, it cracks me up every time. Oh, my God. You've got to talk to Gina Bellman. She is the top girl. She, to me, was the goddess of the show. She had the trickiest part. Oh, Steve Moffat wrote the most wonderful stuff for me. You know, as an actor, you just go... Oh! It's just getting better and better. But And Jane, Gina's part, was quite a tough part to play because she was ex-girlfriend. What were, with, what were they going to do with her? And she just handled it so beautifully in a completely crazed way. But she herself is just one of the best people. I'm so lucky to have crossed paths with her and met her. So you should interview her. She's well, always good. We are, we are still trying to get more people on show because some of our episodes we had to cancel well, I wouldn't say cancel, but we had to put on hold because because of the strike. And for some of our actors who work for yeah. who work for the agency, they can't be interviewed until the strike is over. So oh, they can't be interviews. They can't be interviewed until the strike's over. And those people were John Leguizamo, America Forever, who was in Barbie. She was supposed yes. to be interviewed, but I, I love America Forever. Yeah, oh, she wow. can't. But we had the message from Ray from her publicist saying that she can't be interviewed until the until the strike's over. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell Gina. Yeah, she's been battling a couple of things and she could do. Yeah, yeah she's such a she's a brilliant person. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Also, one other thing I wanted to mention is that we do, besides interviewing people, we also do collaborate with our guests on projects, whether it's projects they're working on or projects we're working on. Uh, we don't have anything at the moment because we're already booked film on a comic book, but we are writing a screenplay with Kevin McNally. It's based on a book that I'm writing. And once we get that off the ground, once the strike is over, yeah, we could definitely try and get you a part if you're interested. 
I would definitely be interested. And, you know, doing this odd little low budget, no budget thing I've just done, it just teaches you time and again, say yes to the unusual because that's where the, the riches lie. That's where the fun lies. Um, yeah, so keep me in mind. And uh, Kevin McNally also is a really good calling card for anyone who knows in um, him. They're serious actors. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. And it is it is a Christmas film, and it's a dark a dark comedy Christmas film. And I, love uh, this I actually have the let's see if I can find the cover. Been working on a few other projects this morning, so I I apologize. I get the, already. I get the feeling you work a lot. Mm -hmm. Very much. I I mean I I work as a photographer. I work as a manager at a at oh. a publish, at a magazine publishing company, and I also freelance on the side. But yeah, this is a comic book that I've been working on. It won't be out till next year, but it's called Night at North Pole. And it's about Santa Claus and his best friend Krampus. And the reindeer are sick and tired of, of pulling his sleigh, being locked in the bar, basically dealing with the shit all year round. So they decide to turn on him. So the reindeer become evil and Santa has to go against his reindeer. But in the film adaptation, it's going to be reindeer zombies instead. So it's like Shaun of the Dead meets a Christmas film and, and it's not kid friendly sadly it's not kid friendly of course yeah, good good uh, but it's and this was my dad's idea he recommended that since there's a thing called mad mad deer disease like Blitzen should be infected and then Blitzen of course bite, bites a human and then the human becomes a zombie but it's a, a, a human zombie but with reindeer features so they become reindeer zombies and it becomes Santa Claus and you know, Krampus and Mrs. Claus and uh, two other characters and they have to go against go against zombies. It's a winner. Mm -hmm. It is. You really hone that and you've got something there. I love it. Yeah, once I told Kevin about it, he was he was he was in. Yeah. So we really can't do anything until the strike is I, over. I didn't realize they weren't even allowed to do interviews, which is really tough because you know, unless you're really well off and um, established, an interview is just um, it's another way of uh, putting yourself out there. And that's really hard if you're not in a, a very comfortable position to be denied that uh, possibility, because that's not that's not acting. You know, that's di a different beast. So that's really that's tough on people. But can I just say, um, when you when you showed me that and started talking about, I, I'm a photographer, I, I also publish a magazine or manage a production, blah, 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 blah. That was the other thing I really think for time and time again. I have no real, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter about me. Um, uh, everybody now, it feels like everyone has to be more entrepreneurial. And I think, I don't want to scare the people who aren't, mm -hmm. but it really, for the newcomers to the business, they really do want to um, have a, a way a, a way of seeing how to make their, their own production companies or uh, get together with friends and, and put shows on so that they are not just reliant on being employed. I'm talking about actors. Um, I have always been too, uh, too embarrassed too polite or too um, lacking in chutzpah to um, to knock on doors and get projects up and running. And I really now see how uh, what a shame that is. And I would really say to everyone coming into the business, just go enjoy everything, but really plug away in different areas, not just the one, because. Uh, life has shown me that you really do need to be a polymath and have more than one string to your bow. So Ben, I think you're doing really well. Thank you. So oh my God, sorry. You can be together like you are to be, ugh. I mean, even getting me on zoom, if I'd had to do it in reverse, you know, we'd never be on. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just really impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been, it's been really nice chatting with you this morning. I uh, wish I could stay longer, but I actually have to get going and prepare for the you next. See? You see, you're a professional. Mm -hmm. Good. Good I for go, you. I have to go prepare so, for the next interview. So, okay. Really lovely you. to see you. Nice to meet you.